Good morning. Good to be here with you all. Um, you'll notice that we've got an additional panel member. For those of you who weren't at dinner last night, Richard McLennan has joined the panel this morning. Um, <coughs> Richard is the CEO of Northern Agricultural Catchments Council in Western Australia. So welcome. Thanks for joining us. So. This morning's panel is really to talk a bit about um, natural resource management and su sustainability, I guess. So it was just a chance to pick up on some of the themes from your presentations this morning and just talk a little, explore those a little bit more. Um, as we've talked about, natural resource management aims to ensure that the environment is managed in a way that provides social, economic and environmental benefits. And so you've talked about environment, uh, sorry, economically sustainable farms, we want to see thriving regional communities, people with strong connection to country and resilient ecosystems. But I think it was you, Manu, that picked up that sometimes these are presented as if they're in tension with each other, as though, you know, it's one or the other, it's a trade-off. And a key challenge, as you've highlighted, is how do we, how do we um, help support decision makers so that it, it's not such a trade-off. Um, so I might start with you, Rosemary, and ask you a question. How do you see environmental and social outcomes being considered by large financial institutions that impact on the environment? So, um, is that working? Great. Um, within financial institutions now, the discipline of what's called environmental, social and governance risk is actually helping those considerations come into mainstream decision making within fi the finance sector whether you're an insurer, asset manager or a bank. So in our credit policies, we're requiring bankers to actually look more closely at the practices of our customers. Um, driven by our natural value strategy, um, which was one of the areas in our environmental agenda, we're on a mission, I guess, to prove that good land and biodiversity management practices will actually improve resilience and productivity of our agri-customers and that that will lead to better outcomes and for us that's lower credit risk as well. Thanks. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, which might take me on to Manu. She, you picked up, um, I guess, that at the moment, sustainable agriculture is effectively a volun you volunteer. You choose to do that and you're kind of on your own, it feels like. Um, how do you think financial institutions and government could influence the ability for farmers to make more both environmental and socially responsible, responsible is not the word, but decisions combined with economic, economic outcomes? I think, um, I mean, there is no single answer. I mean, it sounds trite, but it's the truth. And I think it, it is, there still needs to be a lot more discussion um, and knowledge um, creation before we know what solutions are for a lot of systems. But um, ultimately, I think that that is the key issue. I mentioned about the disciplinary silos and not just within academia. I think that is the key thing is that all of these interacting sectors tend to just kind of get on with their own business a lot and do their own thing with regard to a lot of these issues and I think more integration um, and understanding of uh, these social, economic, environmental needs across the board rather than trying to work out which one is more important, <laughs> if, that, if that makes sense. Is there anywhere that anyone on the panel is seeing that done well? or is seeing it even attempted? I mean, you're certainly working on it at the bank. Is there any other examples where you can think of where policy or business is really sort of trying to work with individuals? There, um, within the finance sector, through um, the United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiative and the Global Canopy Program, there's um, what's called the Natural Capital Finance Alliance. There is also the Natural Capital Coalition, which has developed a protocol to actually engage 
business in really thinking about biodiversity and ecosystem services and, and the role that that plays in uh, the fact that it's underpinning the economy. Um, the language in there that I think is unique is it takes the view, uh, extends the view of environment past the impacts we have to the dependencies that we have on it. Because so once you start having a conversation about how much business depends on environment, it changes the game in why you would then think about conserving it. Yeah, Sarah. <laughs> you know, I think you touch on a really important subject, um, and it's something that we discussed at the dinner last night, actually, <laughs> um, which is, and I really wonder how many people would identify from being from big business in this room, uh, apart from Rosemary. That's a sum total of no one. <laughs> um, I, I think we have a problem in Australia. I mean, Rosemary, you aside, because you come to things, you're great and you're a fantastic contributor, but we have really, really struggled to engage big business in biodiversity. And I don't think it's just us. I mean, we were discussing last night that the previous Threatened Species Commissioner had his major initiative to generate funding for the program engagement with business. Now, I think he would even admit that he completely and utterly failed at that. It was impossible to get people to come on board. And I think we need to really consider why this is in this country, that big business is so unwilling to, to get on board with natural resource management, because I think it's a, it's a massive problem. And we're probably really missing that voice in these, in these forums. Yeah, thanks. And I think um, th there is some dabbling in this area with corporate social responsibility and, and firms doing a little bit, but there's nothing at the scale that needs to happen. But there are some real bright lights, and I look at um, two good examples from Western Australia. One is a group called Wide Open Agriculture that is supported by another group called Common Land. And Common Land is a, a Dutch um, business, and it's very much uh, a philanthropic approach to getting real change along the lines that Manu was talking about in agriculture and financing uh, regenerative agriculture in particular in, in the Netherlands and South Africa and, and now Western Australia. So that kind of initiative, and another one is, uh, is carbon neutral working in our area, which has largely been going through this very difficult uh, carbon financing period with corporate philanthropic support. And so this kind of um, initiative, I think, is, is, is developing, and that gives me quite some hope. Mm. Yeah, just to add, um, I think internationally um, there are plenty of examples. I know other countries are far ahead on this. I know France, um, for example, has just recently incorporated agroecology into their political framework and into their policies, and it's now becoming legislative and regulatory. Um, Switzerland as well, I think, is um, doing things that a lot of European countries are ahead, but there are these examples where they've already started to incorporate them into their legal and political frameworks. Great. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm just stuck on agroecology. I'm picturing all these angry ecologists. But <laughs> anyway, I'll try and move on from that. <laughs> um, Sarah, I've got a question for you. It's kind of into the detail a bit. I'm still, I, I had to write down renovation again, <laughs> or renovate again. I quite like that. Um, I may use it again. Um, it, you, you made a compelling case, but I share your view well and truly about the importance of biodiversity and the importance of green space in urban settings. But it's often seen by particularly local government who have to look after it as a cost, as a black hole on the budget, as a big dark, you know, they put lots of resources in, but what do they get back for it? Um, how do you think we can influence that to, um, to make sure that, ur that, that urban environment, those kind of green spaces are recognised for the economic, social and environmental benefits they provide? Are there, I guess again, is, are there places doing it well? Are there good metrics around that people can use? Yeah, I mean, I think there are places doing it reasonably well. Um, but I think um, three things. Um, firstly, reframing, as you, as you point out, uh, you know, biodiversity is so often seen as being a problem. And I just think we really desperately need to change the language around biodiversity being a massive asset in cities um, and one that you cannot afford to lose any of. We need to, you know, be, be regenerating and, and, and restoring and, and maximising um, exposure to nature. So it's, I think the way to do that is, um, secondly, by 
uh, being conversant in the benefits. You know, I mean, it's not just about. I think the 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 case for doing it uh, conservation for its own sake in cities is compelling. But you know, the health benefits. I mean, who doesn't want to have their child having improved cognitive development? I mean, <laughs> yeah. who wants to have a higher rate of cancer and, and diabetes and asthma and allergies? I mean, they're not. They're such no-brainers. You know, I think it's a total no-brainer. Who, who wants to have a city where everyone's falling down in a heap every time there's a heat wave? You know, we don't want to have that happening. So I think they're just utterly compelling. It's a cheap way of, of solving some really major problems. So I think being, being really conversant. And I think thirdly, we just need to trial all over the place. That's why I'm so excited about Adelaide launching into their sort of um, urban, urban forest strategy, whatever it's going to be called, urban nature strategy. Because I think there are some such exciting programs that can be rolled out um, to just demonstrate um, really the, the benefits you know, quite quickly. Uh, in Melbourne there's a great, great um, green laneways project that people have totally jumped on board and it's really enhanced the livability of the, of the inner city. Um, things like the iconic, the totem species in schools. I mean, what an exciting project. Why aren't we all doing that? You know, it's such a kind of win, 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 you know. Um, it's got STEM, it's got cultural awareness, it's, it's you know, the conservation, I mean, schools take up a lot of space. There's a lot of potential to do good conservation in those areas. Wildlife gardening programs, um, you know, the citizen science stuff that, that I, I talked about. So let's just get in there and do it. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, there, there certainly does seem lots of opportunity and I think um, I take your message about reframing it and we've got to be on the front foot with that. Although then I come back to the gap in the big business and decision makers, um, you know, not necessarily being in the same space to hear that. Um, so we need to keep working on that. Richard, a question for you um, in your role, particularly your current role in NRM. Um, there's a, often regional and remote communities really feel like they're at the really pointy end of where social, economic and environment outcomes meet because, um, you know, for example, land use change at the point that um, carbon, carbon forestry leads to loss of farming ground or, you know, so there's a land use change and people move away from the region. So it really changes the fabric of that community. Is this dropping in and out? Is it because I'm not? Sorry. How can we ensure... How can we ensure that local communities are sustainable in the light of um, those changes, those sorts of changes? How can we keep people on country, I guess, is the question. And it's a great question. I think um, certainly it's, a, it's one very dear to my heart. Actually, while I've got the mic um, and I have the power, I just want to have a, a quick uh, interlude and just say congratulations to the organisers of this conference for the, the approach to gender that they've done. It's been absolutely brilliant. In a previous role, I was the, um, the uh, Affirmative Action Gender Equity Officer for my office, so <laughs> just, just joking. No, I think um, the, the key question there to me is, as, a, as an ecologist, uh, for many years if you asked me, you know, how do I measure sustainability, I would have said it purely in, in ecological terms. You know, I can look at the landscape and say, well, you know, the, the, that ecosystem is functioning or it's not, or biodiversity has been lost or not. But now working in the NRM sector, uh, it is just one of four elements that you must consider. And I think uh, one of the key points in, in Manu's presentation, there was a, a bullet point there that said, you know, in the, certainly in that policy context, that farmers play a key role as the land stewards, as the land carers mm -hmm. and the like. And I think the key thing that we're seeing, certainly in, in more marginal areas, such as where I'm working in, in uh, the northern wheat belt of Western Australia, is that you are seeing a land use change and, and the ways in which we are farming. And in that process, we are losing farmers and farming families and whole communities as a result of that. And so effectively, we're losing these land stewards that Manu was talking about. And I think, if I talk again about uh, a farmer called Stuart McAlpine, he works on a property in a, in a town called Buntine, and uh, he's part of this uh, regenerative agriculture, wide open agriculture momentum. But Stuart, if you talk to him once again, he won't talk about the economic uh, sustainability of his farming operation. He'll talk about the fact that their primary school just closed because so many families have moved away and, and, and they've lost those kids in the primary school. 
and once you lose that you also lose uh, shoppers at the local community store. So now as an ecologist I still will look at the landscape and say that place is in poor shape because the local primary school is just closed and we've lost five stewards who were previously looking after that landscape. So I guess to, to get that kind of true sustainability outcome what we need is a, a proactive policy environment that supports these land stewards to, to stay on the land and to get payment for ecosystem services or whatever so they can get an economic return to enable them to look after the biodiversity assets that uh, people like Catherine were talking about. Mm. Thanks. We probably have time for just a couple of questions. I see one hand up there. Uh, this is a question for Rosemary. Given that fossil fuels contribute to climate change and that farms that have gas wells on them are not insurable, I've cited one form where a bank has rejected a loan because a property has four gas wells on it. Given, aside from climate change, that there is problems with water pollution, soil and air pollution, many health problems for animals and humans, have or are the National Bank prepared to take a stance against giving loans to the fossil fuel companies? So, um, what I'll be able to say for you today is we've started through this work we're doing on climate change, a phased review of the range of sectors that we bank. Last year we started that with, um, and, and that's, they're listed in our sustainability report and we mentioned them in our annual financial report. Last year we started with a review of the coal mining sector and in December um, our chairman at our AGM and pre that announced that NAB would no longer lend to new greenfield thermal coal mines. So there is a change in risk appetite. If you actually look across the banking sector in Australia, you will see similar statements being made by banks as we consider these risks. Thanks. One more question. There's a hand up. Thanks. Um, I wanted to bring this uh, subject of off farm impacts. Uh, in particular, you used almonds as an example. Uh, the off-farm impacts of water in sustainable agriculture. So we're moving to uh, mega farms, low jobs, and consequent impacts on the, the water resources. So it seems to me that the government policy is actually moving us away from sustainable agriculture. Um. Yeah, I, I, won't, I can't comment on the water policy. That's not my um, area. But I think that I think it's more just a case that um, there is the mismatch between the Commonwealth versus state, who's in charge of what, um, with the water issue. With agriculture, it's mostly state governance. So the Commonwealth actually, if you um, look in the constitution, the Commonwealth actually plays a limited re role with. Um, regulating or whatever you want to call it agriculture so I'm not I I'm not going to say what the solutions are it's just that there are these political um, I guess issues about who is going to be in charge of what area and I that's something for the government I guess to um, work out anyway. yeah well, unfortunately, we're out of time, so I am going to, uh, I guess I pick up just a couple of key messages from this panel and this morning, particularly, I guess, for us um, and those of us working um, kind of across the disciplines a bit to really focus on that gap between, between the science, the policy, the business, and try and get more big business um, involved. And... Um, and then that reframing the message, I think, for me, were the two things that I probably took home. Um, could you join me in thanking the panellists this morning? <laughs>